going to be, um, I think, very practical in the sense that we're going to look at at least one passage. I have like seven um, just didn't know how quick we're going to go through them. So um, we're doing how to study your Bible. I don't want to go through everything we've already gone through before. Um, but I feel like it, we're just going to jump in to tonight. So um, on Sunday, I gave a list of some things. Um, and we're going to look at some of those things in more depth but using a passage of scripture. So let me um, lay out first how to see. All right. So does anybody remember the first step that I mentioned on Sunday? Pray. Oh, yeah, that's right. You know what's funny is when you read books on how to study your Bible, that's usually not one of the steps. Um, in fact, I have a, a book from, I think, seminary, and uh, I'm sure it's in there somewhere. But I remember get, I got to an end of a section, I wrote prayer, question mark. Um, God's the author. He wrote it. He's the one that, you know, the Spirit of God gives us understanding. Um, every time we read through the Bible as a church or I'm preparing for a Sunday Man, I'm always learning, and we always need to be ready. And, and prayer, we ought not to look at is, you know, just something mechanical we do, but this is really communing with our God through his word. And so approaching it prayerfully and not like you're approaching a biology book, right? Um, or a geometry book. Those things are great. Those things are fine. Um but you, we are communing with God in his word, and so we must start with, with prayer. Um, uh, so, what, anybody remember the second? What does it say? Yeah. What does it say? And what do I mean by that? What, do, what does it say? <clears throat> the main ideas yeah so you're 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 looking at at main overarching ideas you're looking at context um right um times three right context 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 um so it, at this point i would even recommend if you're let's say you're doing a a bible study um and you're going through the book of james something like that i would recommend reading the entire book of james even if you're just looking at the first chapter or the first five verses of the book of James, because it gives you a whole, uh, a wider view of it. But it's also good to know where does James fit in? Is James an Old Testament book? Is it a New Testament book? Is it after Christ died and rose again? You know, just to know where does this come in redemptive history? So you're, you're thinking about what, where does it fit in the overall Bible context, right? So main idea, um, um, so you want to look at that book, right, um, and, and consider its, its whole. Um, so that's a pretty short, that can be a, actually a pretty short step compared to some of these other things. You might remember the third step. What does it mean? All right. Now this one takes a little bit longer, right? Because you're getting to, to meaning of the passage. And we are going to get a passage here, but I just want to lay it out, and then we'll go through a passage together, okay? Um, and it's, it, there's several that we could go through. It's hard to just select one. Um, so um, who wrote it, right? It's good to know who the author is. Why do you want to know who the author is? Why would that be useful? it gives you some insight about that per like was it an apostle was it some you know paul was it it kind of tells you a little bit the more you know about the author you kind of also know about their maybe their purpose for writing or yeah i think about one of paul's letters while he was in prison and and he he's writing about joy you know and how he's just blessed to think about these believers who were serving and it's just like 
This guy's in prison when he's writing this. And that doesn't stop. You know, it gives it gives a fuller understanding to the, the whole, right, of, of okay, it, it, Paul, think about all he's been through and shipwrecks, and, and yet he's fit, nothing can stop his joy. You know, it can give a lot of um, further insight into um, what a given passage means in view of the author and what they've been through. Job, you read through the book of Job and um, you look at some of the things that he is crying out to God for an answer. And then he's got three friends that are, well, you know, they're not really very friendly, but um, their best ministry happened when their mouths were shut. And, and that's something that, that pastors, myself, need to be reminded of. Sometimes you just need to go sit with people and just be present. Sometimes open your mouth is the worst thing you can do. Um, so who's the author? Um, what's another good question to ask in the meaning? Who are they writing to, right? That matters. Is, is this written to Jews? Is this, am I spelling that wrong? This is it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I forgot about something else. Yeah, yeah. So who's who's going to be receiving this letter? What is it? What is the context of their? You know, you you think about the the words of prophets that are coming to people who are in captivity. You you think about the the words that were coming to Israel while they're in Egypt. Um, trust God for His deliver. Well, is it really hard to trust God for deliver? Well, consider what they've been going through, and you know, the recipient is is very important to. The, the meaning of the words that are coming. Who's the author? Who's the recipient? What's another good question to ask? How will I apply it? Yeah, we will get to. Oh, how what does it mean? You're still on that one. Sorry. Apply. Yeah. Well, um, what does it mean? So you want to look for repeated words here. Why? So. When the author chose a certain word, right, inspired by the Spirit of God, those words are important. Every word of Scripture is important. Every word. Um, God inspired every one of them. So there's times where words are repeated over and over in a given passage. Um, th there's times the word prayer will be repeated four times in three verses. There's times holy. There's times sin. There's over and over and over again driving home a point. Um, and, and sometimes those are idioms where words are repeated. Uh, holy, holy, holy. The Jews actually meant something when they repeated something three times like that. God being thrice holy is, is giving you the concept that there is nothing holy like our God. Um, he, he stands apart from everything else. He could not be more holy than, than what's being described here. You know, So there's, there's meaning behind uh, repeated words. So you want to look for those kinds of things. Um, main characters. So if you're looking at um, a parable and there's not names used, um, you know, unjust, you know, wealthy, um, uh, Pharisee, you want to look at what kind of characters are the scene being set here by Jesus or whoever's telling um, the given parable. Uh, when you, you look at, maybe we'll do this one next week, when you look at Nathan confronting David, right, and, and using this example of a man taking the sheep when he had plenty to pick from, and you are the man. They're, these are powerful ways of, of communicating. So you want to observe uh, the characters, what's taking place. You want to look for words that give indication of time. Um, uh, a lot of times you're reading in the Gospel of John. It'll say, then, after this. Those are important indicators to get a flow of the thought in the time pattern. So looking for words, keywords like that. What about like, it not, would the, like say theme, but it more like, is it teaching? Is it rebuking? Is it, you know, encouraging? Like the purpose, I don't know if that's the... What so the what type of writing? Yeah. Um, so that could be um, that could be the categories that, that you like. Is it is it instruction? Is it is it prescriptive? Is it descriptive? Because you know 
some people, that's where we misapply some Old Testament verses, right? It's giving a description. That doesn't mean you should go and do what is being described in that given passage, right? There's others where there's instruction and those things that we are supposed to be doing, right? Um, but then you have literary types, right? Is it poetry? Is it prophecy? Um, what kind of writing? Is it didactic teaching? Is it... Um, uh, what what is in an epistle? You know, what kind of letter is it that I'm reading? That informs how you approach the words that are there, because you don't approach poetry the same way that you uh, approach uh, a letter written to a church or like an epistle, or that you don't approach a letter like an epistle the same way that you approach prophecy, because it's different. It's you know. Some people are literally expecting a, a woman to be riding a dragon, right? Revelation. They're, they're thinking they're going to literally see that. Um, they're literally thinking there's going to be seven mountains. And yet there's description given saying those seven mountains happen to be kingdoms, right? But some people are looking for locusts and they think those are Apache helicopters. It's like the writing itself determines how you're supposed to approach that, right? Same thing whenever you're reading or watching a movie. There's movies that you watch that are um, actual historical, right? And they try to be true to what happened. You watch that differently than you might watch a science fiction movie, right? Um, uh, we, we had those TV shows um, that I guess are still popular. I don't know. We don't, we don't have normal TV, but um, we just have streaming stuff. But um, what were those shows that were like not supposed to be scripted and reality reality tv shows and and even it comes out that well it was actually all scripted yeah. Yeah. everything yeah. was scripted they already bought a house even though they're walking in another house but they're reenacting <laughs> how it happened and it's like this isn't reality tv you know this is fake it's all fake um so you you but when you were first watching that show and didn't know that it wasn't actually what happened you're like Oh, wow, yeah. Oh. But then you find out, oh, yeah. well, I, I would have approached watching that differently. Because now that I see those shows, when they're looking for a house in the Bahamas, they, I know they've already bought a home. This is fake. Yeah. And I'm like, they're, they're touring this, and they're acting like to make me think. So I'm now looking at this. Okay, which house did they already Christ. buy? <laughs> I watch it differently now. So same thing with the scripture. This actually does connect to the scripture. the same revelation when I found that out about house hunters. So like, hold on. Yes. Yeah, cool, it looks like three houses. What's wrong with you people? You didn't look at nearly enough. Yeah. Right. And you almost wonder, it's like, now that I know they already bought a house and the two houses they were looking at, they didn't necessarily look out before because those have already been sold. You almost <laughs> wonder, do they wish they would have ended up with that one instead? But, but the whole point of that is that you've got to approach the literary type of scripture properly. And here's the thing. This is where people are coming up with, like uh, William Lane Craig, um, wanting to call, you know, um, Genesis 1 through 11 myth, right? This didn't really occur. This is not how it happened. Um, because he's approaching that writing like poetry. Like this isn't, you know, you shouldn't approach it like this is literally what occurred. But um, so it, it's important that you approach the scripture on its own terms. The scripture determines its literary type. We do not. We discover what the literary type is. Just like people say, when did the church determine which scriptures we hold to? Well, the church never did. The church discovered, okay, this is the, the word of God. God is the one who's determined that this is scripture. The church has always held those books as being scripture. Anyway, I, I could get into a lot of that, but we, we, that's not what we're doing tonight. So, so let's talk about how to apply. Um, that one we could probably spend several um, Wednesday nights on because this is where we do get into trouble, don't we? Right? Um, and we did talk about some bad examples of how not to apply. If you recall, oh, this print two sided. That's why I'm missing half my stuff. Um, so, what what does it what does it mean for me? I'm not Israel, right? Unless I'm the new Israel in Christ. Um, what are some good questions you think to ask about how to apply? What are questions you ask when you're reading the Bible? And I'm thinking, what is, what is Job suffering 
and losing his, his kids, losing his farm. Um, what does that got to do with me? What, what questions do you wrestle with? I think it makes you look at any situation you're going through now and evaluate your heart and might make you think of future events that if you're, that could be, that could happen and think, wow, you know, if I lost my family, would I really still praise God or would I want to curse him or, you know, if I lost everything, if I still have Jesus, if I really lost anything at all. Right. Yeah. So, so when we come to passages of scripture, we should examine ourselves in light of what we're reading, right? So I, I think it's helpful whenever we're, you're, you're looking at a passage of scripture and Jesus is rebuking people, we, we want to think the best of ourselves, right? And so often we think we're the believers that are supporting Jesus and not the people that are opposing him. But I like to, I like to think, okay, where is it that I'm like this Pharisee here? Where is it that I'm like the legalist here? Where is it that I'm like the licentious person that, that tries to excuse my sin? Um, where is it that instead of me being like David and ready to take on Goliath, where am I like Israel and shaking in my boots, not knowing what to do? And, and quite honestly, I think that's, that's a, a, a more balanced approach when you're looking to apply, not reading yourself into the text, right? But instead examining your heart in view of the different hearts that God is exposing in the text. Okay, God, where's my heart? Who, who am I more like? Um, am, I, am I ready to, to stand alone and say, you foolish people, trust God. God can destroy this. You, you don't need to worry about it. So it's good to, to examine ourselves in light of what God reveals in. And in under-examining yourself, right, um, there are times that, that sin is talked about in the Bible. Okay, God, are you... Are you highlighting sin in my own heart through this passage? Reading through Job, God is highlighting sins in my own heart as I've read through accusations um, that are, are given there, warnings that are given in the book of Job. So um, we should be asking, what, what sin uh, do I need to repent of? Right? Uh, we, we should be asking... Um, uh, how can I trust God more in view of the passage, right? Now, listen, you could come up with an infinite list of things to interact with. So it, it's not like you do that with every text. It, it's good to let the text kind of dictate how you're going to be applying it, right? There's, there's myriads of application, but some are more plain on a given passage than, than others, um, depending on what the point of the text is. And that's just it. God's word has a point to itself, right? It, it has meaning, right? And that's why you spend time in meaning before you spend time in application. What is the point of the passage? I've looked at it in context. I, I'm looking at what it means, who it's written to. So it has one meaning, but it can have lots of application. But that application should flow from that one meaning. So it can't just go anywhere. It's guided, harnessed, it's latched to the meaning. So your questions are affected by the meaning of the text. So if it's instruction to Israel, God, where is it that my heart needs to be instructed? Where is it my heart needs to be encouraged? There's times where um, Jesus taught a uh, parable how we ought to always pray. Okay, God. My first reaction whenever I coming up on situations, is it reaction is, okay, I need to pray, right? Um, so the point of the text should guide where we go with our application. Does that make sense? Um, does the passage require me to change my beliefs? That's a good point of application right there. Is there something in this that challenges what I have believed and it seems like the scripture is saying something different than what I had believed. Uh, I remember when I was in high school, um, I believed in the Trinity. I still do. <laughs> but I was dating a girl who was a oneness Pentecostal, and I didn't know what that meant. And her father, who was a pastor, 
sat me down and totally flipped me upside down and showed me all the passages. I and the Father are one. And then he started telling me what, so he told me this is what it says, and then he told me this is what it means. And, and the meaning was far different than what I was understanding. And But I was so overwhelmed that I'm just like, maybe he's right, and I wrestled with. So there might have been a time in high school where I was a one this Pentecostal and, and repented of that pretty quickly. <laughs> Um, I wasn't speaking in tongues or dancing in the aisles, um, though they did in their church. Um, but my, my eyes were on the girl, um, and, and the father took advantage of the theology side there. But, um, I'm sure you would never do that. No. No? <laughs> I, I did. I, Wait a second. Confession. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, my heart was not in the right place, that's for sure. Um, so... Um, so, um, a, another good question always to ask is how does the gospel connect, relate, right? You're, um, some of this was, was on Sunday, but you're reading the book of Leviticus and feeling like this is impossible. You're reading the Deuteronomy, the, all the laws and all the, how they're supposed to do this. And you're like, no one can keep this God. And, and it's almost like, yeah, that's the point. So then where is my hope, God? If, if, if everyone falls short of your glory, and, and this is why it's good to know what, what is the, the context, um, where is it in redemptive history, and therefore in view of that, how am I supposed to relate to looking at when I'm reading through and feeling guilty you see Job listing all the great things he does for friends and family and, and how people come to him for wisdom, sitting at the gate. And just like, this dude was amazing, right? Um, and I am, you know, well, Job's a type of Christ. He, God used Job to be a type of Christ here. And ultimately, when you're looking at Job, feeling guilty about yourself, realize where you fall short. Of Job, yes, maybe him, but ultimately of Christ, the suffering servant who was humiliated but was exalted after his humiliation to save you. And what did Job do at the end of the book? We're not there yet, but he provided a sacrifice for all his loser friends. Um, and we are the loser friends of Jesus who provided a sacrifice for us. So it's good to ask, how does the gospel connect? How how does this point me to Christ, to, to hope in Christ, trust in Christ, view Christ? Mm -hmm. um, we have such a richer reading of the Old Testament than anyone has had in all of history. Because the Jews, they had a forward looking to, but it was such a small picture. And you can see why they got focused on the law. Um, because they didn't see that hope that was held out in the gospel all spread throughout. Um, because they were hard of heart and deaf ears and stiff neck, which we can be too sometimes. But thanks be to God, we're at a place in redemptive history where God has shined a light from the New Testament on the old so that you, when you see it, that you don't see all law, but you see a holy God who is pointing you to a Savior who's gracious and good. Um, so how the gospel connect is something that all of us should ask. Um, in, in our application for sure. Any questions or any further thoughts before we jump into an actual example of scripture? <clears throat> I just love it as you know you're reading through the Bible and just the, how supernatural this book is. I, I was telling somebody the day like you know it's not coincidence as you're reading through something <coughs> it's like something that you're struggling with or something oh how many times i've been have i've had a question or a conversation with somebody about something and then just during the course of that week it's in my the next mm -hmm. that i think i uncover in my own personal bible study or i think i was telling carolyn or someone the other day i was i'm reading through samuel and as my kids were upstairs fighting and going nuts and being mean to each other Oh, I did not want to go up and like set them straight. And I'm just like, oh, how much easier. Like, they'll figure it out. And as I'm sitting there reading, I'm reading about <laughs> Samuel's uh, sons or like Eli's. Eli's sons. Okay. Yeah. So Eli? Yeah. He did. Eli's him. sons. And he, you know, I'm thinking, well, yeah, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> better, better go up there. But just little things like that. 
Uh, constant. You might as well just stay up there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody, let's turn to, um, where is this passage? I did not write down the reference. Um, well, that's helpful. <coughs> it's in Numbers. Let's see if I can remember. Is it Numbers? Mm-mm. Oh, no, no. It's Exodus. What am I thinking? Mm. So this is um, the fiery serpents. Um, and it's verse 4 through 9. <laughs> um, man. Well, I know what to do. Sorry, guys. I'm so glad I'm so prepared. Um, Numbers 21. Yeah. Numbers 21. 21, and we're going to start in verse 4. So, first thing we're going to do is look at what it says, right? Guys, I'm going to move context down to meaning. Um, context is important in there, but just makes more sense to have it under meaning. So, 21, um, would somebody read verses 4 through 6? From Mount Hor, they set out right away to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we load this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many of the people in Israel, many that, so that many people of Israel died. Yeah. Okay. So, um, again, let's think about the context of this, or the. Um, let's think about where this is in redemptive history. Who wrote Numbers? Moses. Yeah. So Moses wrote Numbers, and where have they just come from? Egypt. Yeah, so they've been um, amazing miracles. I mean, the, the ten plagues were miracles enough, right? And then splitting the sea, and then destroying the most powerful army that's pursuing them on the face of the earth, and then providing quail, and providing water from a rock. I mean, these things are miraculous, right? And if you and I would have seen them, we wouldn't have been growing and complaining, <laughs> right? We wouldn't have been hoping for Egypt, right? All right, I'm getting an application, sorry. Um, so so th this is the context of what's going on. These are all the things that they've beheld, and what are they doing? What does it say that they're doing? They're, they're grumbling. They are. They get impatient. They start grumbling. They start complaining. Um, and they actually voice, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die? Notice, notice, notice it says in verse 5, they spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food. There's no water. We loathe this worthless food. Um, so, so what is the response of God after all these things that he's done and he's been good? What is the response of God in verse 6? Is that the fiery serpents? Yeah. Um, that word fiery, I did a, um, I preached on this a while ago. I remember that word fiery means like, it, it's, it's not like they're, 
on fire, but when they bite, the response would be a burning sensation, right? And this is a poisonous bite, um, and it, it, it's a fiery, relates more to the effect that it has when it bites. So what does it mean? My nearly inspired version says venomous. Venomous, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, nearly. That's why the sanctify is fire. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. But it means venomous. So that's where good translation is, comes in helpful. Um, so it, they bit the people. That's what snakes do, right? Um, but but notice it says the Lord sent them. Okay? God sent them. That's, that's important. They bite the people. The people die from this. Um, so... Verse 7 through 9. I keep wanting to jump into uh, application. This is why you have to stick in meaning for a little bit here. Somebody read 7 through 9. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned against, we have sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on the pole. Put it up on a pole. Then, when anyone was bitten by the snake and looked at the bronze, looked bitten by the snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Okay, so um, the response then of the people after thousands of people have died elsewhere—it's not here, is it? I think there's somewhere that it, it does talk about it. How many they were? Um, I don't think I put that down. Um, so we won't talk about that. Um, so the people's response to God's judgment on them was what? Verse 7. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> I was rereading it when you asked the question. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. <laughs> they, they, well... What was the people's were, response to God's judgment? Oh, they were repentant. Yeah, they yeah. repented, right? That's exactly what they're doing. They're crying out. They acknowledge their sin. We've sinned. And then they specify what they've sinned. We've spoken against the Lord. Notice they didn't say, we just spoke against you, Moses. They're identifying, yes, that we've sinned. We spoke wrongly against the Lord. We spoke wrongly against you, Moses. And then they cry out for what Moses is. Moses is a go-between, right? Between them and God, just like he was with Pharaoh. Right? He would, he would speak to God on behalf of Pharaoh, on behalf of Egypt, on behalf of Israel. And he's doing that again. He's an intercessor. We won't get to application there yet. So Moses, what do he do? He does what he does. He intercedes. He prays to God for the people. And then how does God respond to Moses' prayer on behalf of the people? In verse 8. Snake on the pole. <laughs> yeah. Weird. Okay, God. That's odd. Don't you think? You make a bronze idol. Like, yeah. Why are we looking at a bronze? Like, we're not supposed to. God, did we just get in trouble with the golden calf thing? Like, you're telling us to do this, right? So, put this, you know, um, I remember reading the commentary on this um, about why bronze, and um, John Gill said, if I remember correctly, that that the the that bronze metal shining in the sun would have made it reminded them probably of the, the burning venomous bite right um, I don't know he's speculating because it doesn't say that but you, you can you know imagine um, but we're not told why so fiery serpent set it on a pole everyone is bitten when he sees it shall live so what did Moses do? He did exactly what God told them to do. And what did the people do? What God told the people to do. And what did God do when the people and Moses did what they told them to do? He, he did what he said he would do. And he caused them to live. But isn't that interesting, right? So they... they they're not given medicine. 
right? This isn't a, this isn't a message against medicine. They are told to trust God, and when they trust God and do what they're told to do, they live, right? So they have a really serious consequence to even ask for say they sin in the first place. I mean, you couldn't have figured it out when you just started mumbling and like, you know, what? sorry, I just need to. <laughs> right. yeah. so we see a theme with these guys because they're not very smart <laughs> let's get to meaning let's get to application now and and remember she said they they're the not very way. smart and let's not get our toes toe stepped on um, whenever we apply that part to ourselves so um, so 15 minutes to apply this passage so first let's deal with what's dealt with first the people are blessed by God, they're sent out, and they start to grumble and complain against God and Moses, right? How, how does that apply to us in our lives? We have very short-term memories of what God does for us, how quickly we forget, and we are ready to move on and complain about the next hardship that we face. Right. And not, and, you know, Anybody else struggle with grumbling, complaining in this life? <laughs> and forget all the goodness and miracles of God, right? Um, if we went through all the things that Job went through, how high would our grumbling and complaining against God? I, I, God would not have been able to, in all that Job did, he did not sin. It would not be, in all that Chris did, he did not sin um, against God. It might, Corey might be able to get away with that, but not Chris. Um, I, I am so quick to grumble and complain. Um, and and what what is grumbling and complaining? Ingratitude. Yeah, lack of, of gratitude. I want you guys to turn to um, 1 Corinthians 10, 9 through 13. So this is an important thing of application. You're in the Old Testament... <laughs> And you see, uh, you see something going on here. You want to look for passages in the New Testament where they call back to Old Testament. So those, those columns in the middle of your Bible that have references, take the time to look at them because it will give so much more meaning to the application than if you just stick alone. You can get good, no question, but... There's a reason that God in his word references back. And this one especially is very unique. Um, I'll read that if you don't mind. 1 Corinthians 10, 9 through 13. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. What do you think he's talking about? This, <laughs> this very passage. Look at verse 10. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. So this isn't the only time that Israel grumbled and complained and God punished them. Now, there's multiple times, but this is one of them. But, but notice, we ought not to, like Israel did, put Christ, who is God, notice, put him to the test. Um, and, and by example, we see how serious God takes grumbling and complaining, such that he killed some people with serpents. Um, and these were his chosen people, right? It's not like these were some hooligans, right? Wait. Um, no grumbles, destroyed. Verse 11. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages, we won't get into eschatology there, but interesting, the ages has come. Notice what verse 11 says about this, exactly the passage we're looking at. It was written down as an example for you and I, to teach you and I not to grumble and complain and whine against our God. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. Then it goes into temptation. No temptation is overtaking you that's not common to man. How much of the Old Testament is an example for us of people that can so easily be overcome by temptation? And yet we see, this is what we tell our kids. Mom and dad been there. You don't need to experience stupidity. God had me walk through that so I could tell you not to walk through that, right? And yet they say, I need to learn that on my own. No, you do not. And here's a verse 
to back up, telling them, God says you don't need to learn that on your own. You need to learn from someone else's stupidity. Learn from Israel's stupidity. Learn from your mom and dad's <coughs> stupidity. You don't need to learn it by experiencing. That's a lie from the enemy. So, sorry I'm preaching. Um, but you hear that um, often. You hear parents say, oh, yeah, but they just, whenever they come in for counseling from me, Oh, but Johnny, he just, you know, needs to experience life for himself. No, and you need to tell him he doesn't. You need to stand up, Mom and Dad, and, and tell them when they're wrong. And point them to the Scripture and say, no, trust God in what he says. And not that listening to the voice of their friends that are saying that same stupid lie from the devil. Anyway, that's been a sensitive one over the years. But, um, uh... Common to man, God is faithful. He'll not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he'll also provide the way to escape. So l listen, these people were not eating as well as they were now, right? I'm sorry, but manna burgers and quail and, and water from rocks compared to what most of us are eating night and day and what they were eating in Egypt, at least they had their meat pots, remember, right? That's what they were longing for. They were longing for the food that they so long enjoyed, even though they were being put to death in Egypt. So mistreated, but at least we had a nice cuisine. And God, we're not being killed anymore, but the, your meal plan stinks. Um, so uh, the reality is, is that God is not going to walk us through a, a temptationless life that isn't meant to stir us up to grumble and complain against him. He will put you and I in circumstances that we're not comfortable. We're, it's not as nice as it used to be. And God, why are you doing this? This isn't fair, God. Why, you know, in, in such where we're accusing God that he's not been good and we're not thankful. That's the problem of Romans 1, where God starts handing people over to their sin. It starts off because they were not thankful. They didn't give thanks to God for his goodness. And so he hands them over to their sins that they want. This is what we see happening in this passage. This is what's being warned about in 1 Corinthians. You'll be tempted to grow and complain in this life. Your health's not going to be as good as it used to be when you were 15. <laughs> right? Life isn't as is, is smooth as it used to be before you had children. Right? <laughs> that you're caring for. Um, there, there's all sorts of things that will change in life. But you and I... That's why one of the, the things in how to study your Bible that I wanted to include it in my kid's journal was, what am I thinking God for today? View of what I've just read. Life is hard. I'm in the hospital. Whatever the circumstance, what am I thankful for today? Um, so that we are not grumbling, complaining, but rather lifting up praise, even in the midst of the Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Right? Yeah, I read somewhere one time that instead of when stuff happens and anything happens, you know, instead of just always asking God why, 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 it's what, 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 what are you trying to show me? Yeah. What am I to learn? And what, it's good. You know, and I think it's a good way to help us mm -hmm. think about it that way. Um, uh, Amen. All right, let's go back to our passage again in Numbers here. So the Lord sent fiery serpents. They bit the people so that many of the people of Israel died. So what, what, what application is there when you look at people getting bit by fiery or venomous, thank you, Joey, snakes, <laughs> and they die from it, dying from the judgment of God. Remember, that's what we looked at. God is judging the people and it brings death. What application is there for that for us? How can we apply that to ourselves? <clears throat> For all of us then, you fall short of the glory of God. Sure, all of us do. We, we do all sin. Um, yes, we're no better than Israel. Well, if I had seen all those miracles, I would have been grumbling and complaining against God. I, I would have been, thank you, God, for this 972nd day of manna. 
<laughs> Man, we're so spoiled. We have indoor refrigeration. Think of how many people throughout history have not had. You can just drive to the store and buy any sort of meat cut. It might cost you an arm and a leg today, but you can still do it. Um, all the variety. Wow. Um, but yeah, um, the wages of sin is death, right? Right? Sinning against God brings death. It brings harm. It brings separation. It's not a good thing. We do not want to sin against God. And God has shown us an example. Sinning against God brings death. And guess what? We've all sinned. We all have experienced that death that is being talked about here, spiritual death. So this is physical death, right? But we know going back to the Garden of Eden that sinning against God brings not just physical death, it brings spiritual death too, right? Um, not only that, but there's also New Testament passages that talk about the Corinthian church. What were they doing such that it brought death to some of the church members? They were taking communion and God killed some of them because of what? What were they doing in their, in their life that when they took communion that God said, yeah, some of you have eaten and you've died and it's because of this. Not repentance. Yeah, they were sinning. They were tolerating sin amongst themselves that wasn't even named among the Gentiles. A man was sleeping with his mother-in-law. Not only that, they... Um, they, when they were getting together on the Lord's Day, they were being very selfish and greedy, right? And not caring about others getting their food. Um, and, and God, they were so filled with sin that in, in taking communion, this is a holy commemoration of the death of Christ, and they were just abounding in sin in their life, and God killed some of them for living like that before him and desecrating the Lord's table. Um, it says some of you are sick and some of you have died um, because of that. So even believers, God can bring death upon them, physical death, for continuing in sin, even after they know Christ. Um, so God still judges um, and brings um, even earthly consequences for our stupidity even after we know Jesus. Um, so, but this can relate, obviously we can apply this to spiritual death, we can apply this to physical death, um, for grumbling, complaining, sinning in some way against God that is just like, okay, it's... All right, verse seven through nine. We've sinned, we spoke against the Lord and against you, pray to the Lord, and then the bronze serpent. How is it that, that we can apply verse 7 through 9? Remember some of the questions that we came up with with application. In fact, I'll just point you. How does the gospel connect? Well, it's just a mirror of us going to Jesus through the Father, to the Father, the gospel of forgiveness. Yeah. Um, I mean, the snake was lifted up, you know, image of Jesus being lifted up. Yeah, the very thing that brought death to them, right? The curse, the curse of God brought on them, was put on the pole, put to death on a pole for them to look at. Does that remind you of anything? Was something else, right, took, the, took our curse on himself, and all we have to do is look to Christ, and we, we live. In fact, turn to John chapter 3. A lot of people don't know the context of John 3.16. But look, look at John 3.12, beginning verse 12. And this is, again, context. Who, who is talking to who in John 3.12 through 18? Jesus is talking with Nicodemus, right? Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He, he thinks he's golden. Right, But Jesus has come around. He's starting to question some things. He wants to talk to Jesus privately. There's all sorts of different views on why it's nighttime and if he was ashamed and all that kind of stuff. 
um, uh, to talk to Jesus in public. And um, so Nicodemus has got some questions. Jesus got some answers. And Nicodemus is like, what are you talking about? I don't get you. You're talking in ways I don't understand. And then Jesus says, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So he's using earthly examples about the wind, right? And the Holy Spirit moving. And Nicodemus is like, I don't understand. And he's like, well, if I, if I start talking to you about things, heavenly things, you're not going to get that either. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Um, so here you get into verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man be so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So literally, he's, he Nicodemus would have been very familiar with this situation. He would have known as soon as he said Moses lifted up the serpent, he wouldn't have had to been instructed on that whatsoever. So Jesus is making it very plain for him in one sense. So he's saying the Son of Man. Uh, that would have had would have meant something to Nicodemus too from Daniel, Ezekiel. Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now Nicodemus, I, I don't even think it's this yet, but so Jesus is taking this Old Testament picture and saying, just like when the people were filled with sin and death had come upon them. And God brought something to save them and give them physical life, right? So like that, I must be lifted up so that people will believe on me and that they will have not just physical life, right, but have eternal life. That whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And then that's where you go into verse 316, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, or his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order, in order that the world might be saved through him. God did not send the serpent on the pole, right, to condemn Israel. He sent the serpent on the pole to save Israel, just like, just as Jesus he was not sent to condemn the world. The world was already condemned. The world was already bitten. The world was already under the curse of death. But Jesus was sent to save. And, and listen, each one of you and I have sinned against God. We've earned death. Death has been, we're already condemned, right? We were condemned without Christ. But praise be to God, Christ has been sent. So when you're coming, listen, to Old Testament passages, this is a very important question to ask because time and time again, the biblical authors show what the answer is, how Jesus is revealed in this. In fact, I had a list of seven more to go through with you tonight, but we're already over time. Um, examples of Old Testament pictures, and it says nothing about Jesus. And then yet the New Testament will come back and shine that light and say, don't see, this was pointing to Jesus. And so so let me let me just ask a question. Why is this such a critical thing for us as we're reading the Bible to ask the question of how does this passage I just read connect with Christ? Why is that so important? A point of application. Why is that so important? Christ is the gospel and everything in the word should point to that. Yeah, if Jesus took the time after his resurrection to walk with some guys on the road and show them, and twice in Luke 24, show them how Moses, the Psalms, and the prophets, and the law was all about him, then that's a message God was wanting to get across to us. And if we're not asking the question, okay, God, how are you trying to reveal Jesus to me in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, then we're missing one of the main things that we're supposed to be getting out of every time we come to the scripture. Let me ask one more question. I know it's time. I'm sorry. Why is that so important for us, though? So it's important because, yes, that's the design of God's word. But why is that so important for our daily application? You 
you've got an answer. What is it? <laughs> I do, but I don't mind the silence. I don't mind you wrestling and thinking. I, I, I want you, um, because because the truth is, there's we, we could give lots of answers, and, and I have two that I, I just want to share, but um, what I, I, you might share something I'm not thinking of right now, so I, I like to give time. So let's ask the question again. Why is it so important? Yeah, yeah. So, so it's a, one reason it was important is because that's how God wrote Scripture. Yeah, hey, what's up? So God wrote Scripture such that it would point us to Christ over and over and over and over again. But why is that so important to us that we're pointed to Christ over and over and over again? Why do we need to be? <laughs> right, right. I mean, I've come to Christ, I've trusted on Christ, and yet I keep falling in this stupid pud, this pud, this puddle <laughs> of sin. <laughs> I don't know what pud is, but um, um, I, I keep going back to, I keep going back to Egypt. Why? <laughs> um, and, and so the gospel gives me hope. You know what? God's not done with me yet. Christ is still working. And you know what? My performance isn't what determines my being accepted by God, but it's looking at Christ who was crucified, died, and raised for me. So it's so not only does it ease the conscience when we've given over to sin, but it also gives us hope in this life that God's not done with me yet. Uh, I'm still in this wilderness, wandering, waiting for the promised land. This is a worthy question to ask. <laughs> and, and, oh, that's another passage. Can God spread a table in the wilderness? That was Israel's complaint. <sighs> yes, he spread a table, but, but that was yet a picture of the table that he spread for you and I in the sun, uh, the body of Christ being broken in the bread. That's what we live on is Christ. We're not living on the steak that we get from the store. Well, we don't get steak story to get ground beef right um we live on christ um and 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 until we go home for that final feast with god not final but ultimate feast with with god in heaven he spread a table in the wilderness for us and it's just the taste of what's to come oh yeah so so because we need the hope of the gospel we need the encouragement of the gospel and it also keeps us from relying on us (laughs) And it causes us to rely on Christ. We need the gospel over and over, every morning, every night, um, to to be motivated to live in view of the gospel. Ugh. So, good questions to ask and wrestle through. Next week, um, I might go through some more examples, but I also want to go through some literary types with you. But I also want to look at a passage and show, you might think I'm a nerd here, but it's very helpful diagramming a passage, right? So when you look at a passage, you can get so much more out of it just sitting and saying, okay, how's this connect? How's this connect? And so I, I, I want to do that, but we might go through some, some more examples. So I'll close this in prayer. Sorry, I went over. Lord, we thank you so much for your work. We thank you for, it. like a good book, has one central theme, and what a glorious central theme, and it's not us. <laughs> it's you, it's Christ, it's your love for us, your grace and mercy, your holiness, your goodness. It's Jesus. And Lord, um, how we need to be pointed to Jesus again and again. And how we can know that we're forgiven, know that we're loved, and know that you're not done. And you're seeing us through this wilderness and giving us the best food uh, to sustain us through. Thank you, God. Help us to wrestle with your word as we read it each day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. See you all next week. Well, next week. I feel like I'm teaching a class now. I'll see you Sunday. What am I saying?